Welcome to Melomania Chatcast. I'm Andrew Cady, a musician and producer. In each episode, I talk to a colleague about how they do music. This time we have Callum Stewart, who is a Scottish folk musician. He plays illan pipes, whistles and the wooden flute. Non-folkies have probably heard Callum on film soundtracks for the likes of The Hobbit and How to Train Your Dragon. Long based in Brittany, Callum has established his own recognisable style of Scottish folk music. He's released countless albums under his own name and collaborated with other leading folk artists including Julie Fowlis, Donald Shaw and many others. In Germany, he's recorded and toured with chart topper Angelo Kelly, which also involved arena tours and countless primetime TV appearances. Welcome, Callum. Hi, Andrew. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good to see you. So just to get, get us started, here's an maybe easy question. How did you get into traditional music and what kind of music would you be playing if you hadn't have got into trad music? Oh, very good. Two questions. Yeah, so I was brought up in uh, in Murray in Speyside in the north of Scotland. So I was lucky enough to be brought up in a very musical household. Um, everybody played. Uh, my sister fiddle, my mother fiddle, and then later cello. My father um, played a bit of the mouth organ, sang and played the whistle. My brother the guitar. So there was always music going on everywhere. Um, and then also in the local community, uh, the Cayleys, the dances, um, traditional music was very much part of the the local local scene in the community and things. So it was, uh, yeah, not not many questions asked really. It yeah. was just a kind of something that everybody did and something that I grew up with, um, and I and I've loved playing it ever since I could hold an instrument. Really, um, what music would I be playing if I wasn't playing traditional music? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I actually don't <laughs> well, know. well, actually, it's just, it just seems so in inevitable that you would play traditional music with that background that. Um, that I'm, I'm sure you haven't even considered it. Yeah, I mean, I love all sorts of music, yeah. you know, um, and I dare say uh, those other musics have a bit of an influence in arrangements and uh, um, and the way that I sometimes present tr traditional music. But um, yeah, essentially, it's very much rooted in where I'm from and the kind of memories of childhood, community, sense of place, you know, so no matter no matter where I am playing in the world, that whenever I'm playing traditional music or music from home or uh, Irish music, Scottish music, whatever, uh, even compositions inspired by places from home, I'm very much kind of there in my mind, in my head, I'm, I'm, I'm there. So um, it's quite a grounding thing. Yeah, for me. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's pretty obvious in your music. Uh, but, but you did mention, you know, the influence of other types of music. I just sort of had a quick listen in to the the top couple of tracks on on the streaming services under your name and yeah. uh, one of the first things it was the angels share came up first your your composition and that has some sort of okay, yeah. dead stops in that kind of reminded me of um bands like the foo fighters or you know sort of yeah uh, like real proper dead stops where where it it sounds almost like it's been cut as well to to um so you obviously use um modern arrangement ideas in the context of traditional music, but also uh, use the recording techniques. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> to, to, to answer your first part, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a conscious thing. Like I said, I, I always kind of think of, of my my band and my the music that I produce on albums as being quite simple, really, and, and quite like traditional, and even though there are compositions, but um, also, uh, from from an ex from an external point of view, maybe it seems different, but um, yeah, I, I guess um, chord arrangements and 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 rhythmic stuff, which which uh, reinforces the tunes, um, can can go anywhere and can, and can come from anywhere, pop or rock or whatever. But I definitely don't sort of consciously go out to do that. I don't think I, you know, I I, I do a lot of work as a. Um, for want of a better term, a hired gun, you know, playing with different other bands or different projects, not always traditional music, um, quite often not actually. Um, so when I come back to doing my own thing, it feels like kind of coming home and coming back to something which is um, not necessarily simple, but something which is uh, straightforward and um, is obvious and, and um, is, is very much more about the energy um, rather than sort of complicated chordal or rhythmic arrangements. Um, you know, music essentially for 
getting people dancing and getting energy levels up and keeping people's morale up you know that's traditional music for me so um but yeah if if if, if there are kind of similarities to other musics or kind of uh complicated arrangements in there then that's uh that's a kind of a byproduct i think it's definitely not something that i would, would seek to uh to to do necessarily um very much about a kind of a good strong tune and kind of good driving um wholesome accompaniment without being sort of too too clever for itself really that's very much where i'm at you must listen to other types of music as well or or are you very very focused when you left to your own devices on traditional music oh no yeah absolutely i mean i love i love uh listening to to the radio and just seeing whatever's on yeah. uh often my my kids will put the radio on and uh they'll want a certain uh, radio station or or songs coming on i'm like oh, okay right this is what <laughs> this is what the, the the youngsters are listening to now so um i i, I think anything which has similar energies to tra tra traditional music so like like you're talking about rock or pop and stuff like that before i think anything which has a real kind of drive and a real kind of good a good kind of groove and energy i'm totally into um so pop music depending on what it is uh if it's really well done and and it's got a really good kind of kick to it i love it really good um rock music's same like the attitude and the kind of real kind of um, it's us against the world type yeah. vibe in bands. I love that. I really love that. I think um, quite often uh, as musicians, we can be quite in our own heads or, you know, thinking about stuff too much. But essentially, when you get on stage with a group of uh, people, um, it is basically just you and these other people on stage delivering something. So I, I like that kind of raw, um, raw energy that you get from a lot of rock groups, metal groups, things like that. I wouldn't say that... <laughs> Uh, you know, their, their comparisons musically necessarily, but in terms of the attitude, in, in terms of like, right, come on, let's go for it, rather than sort of being too much in our own heads and stuff like that. That's, yeah, I, I do yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, that that kind of um, chimes with me as well, because uh, often when, when yeah. I go on stage with Mark, my band partner with Broom Besoms, in in my head, I'm the lead guitarist in... In a, in a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on a small stage somewhere in my head. I'm, I'm sort of standing on the side of a mountain with a camera and a helicopter circling around me while I'm playing some little fiddle solo. Yeah. Uh, it's just exactly, that kind yeah. of sort of raw energy feeling that's maybe quite, maybe different to the way it looks or comes across, but um, you, you need that kind yeah. of drive to, to, to deliver a, a, a big performance, perhaps. <laughs> especially playing acoustic instruments like yeah. you know yourself on guitar and singing and playing fiddle you it almost requires more because you haven't got this big kind of stack of amplifiers or millions of pedals or drum kit to like uh fall back on it's, it really is you know uh, an acoustic instrument you and maybe a few bandmates and you've got to kind of go for it so i think yeah. definitely more so with acoustic instruments you know yeah and and okay that's a that's an interesting point as well with the acoustic instruments because it's because you don't have all those uh, requirements of having amplifiers and stacks of stuff, you can actually play yeah. really small, intimate venues without PA, if necessary. So what's the smallest yeah. venue you've ever played in? The smallest venue? Um, I mean, like like uh, like most traditional musicians, we, we, we quite often find ourselves in pubs or those kind of atmospheres where, or those kind of places where it's... Uh, uh music is is as much for the musicians playing it as it is for kind of people coming to have a drink or you know yeah so i think quite often i i i, I find myself in pubs um when i'm not on tour obviously when i'm on tour and things it's quite hard to find time to do that but when i'm back and kind of um back at home uh, i try to go out to to sessions they, they're probably the smallest places so that, that's less and, of a um, performance then isn't it that's like a session for those who don't know it's like the traditional musicians get together and just play yeah play for the, the the group in a circle but in terms of concerts and things like that um yeah i mean it varies it really varies and it depends who 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 i'm playing with in my own band or playing with other artists you know i've been really lucky to have been uh invited to play with a whole range of different people and, and the venues can vary from you know massive massive venues uh several thousand seaters and then you can find yourself a few weeks later after the end of the tour playing in a uh, playing a, a trad gig <laughs> in a in a small place equally you can do big trad gigs as well you know that that happens yeah, as well yeah. 
But um, yeah, I love them all. I think yeah. the most intense gigs or concerts rather are the smaller ones when when you're when you're not um, when you're not mic'd up. There's nowhere to hide. Uh, quite often you have to kind of like squeeze your way through the audience <laughs> to get to, you, to your little part of the place where you're playing. Um, yeah, I love them all. Yeah, I love them do, all. do you find it more scary to play the smaller ones where you don't have the space to spy, do you, uh, hide? Do you think you can get away with more at a bigger gig? Relax more, perhaps? Do you know what? Yeah. Do you know what? I, 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 I do my own, do my own, get, do my own concerts. I'm, I'm, I'm never really nervous. I'm, I'm more kind of like excited um, about trying new things and kind of, I, I, I really get nervous in that sense. Um, uh, playing for other people, I think you're you're so concentrated on their music and getting it right for them because you want to put their songs, um, you know, you're trying to accompany their songs or or add something to their songs in the best way possible. So um, those those type of things are require different energies for sure. Um, yeah, like when it's play with my own band, we're just like, right, this is it, guys <clears throat> or girls, let's just go for it. And then all those times, all those kind of things that you've talked about in practice, the practice rooms or arrangements, it's like, right, let's just go for it. Whatever happens, happens. Um, but yeah, playing for other people as a guest artist, and you you don't, it's maybe you're leaving the energy to uh, the, the, the the limelight to them. And you're kind of very much in a kind of an accompanying role. Obviously, the, the level of accompaniment different, differs. Sometimes you're brought into the, the limelight a little bit more and then you kind of come back again. Um, so that in terms of the concerts, uh, in terms of the uh, the type of projects and intensity, in terms of like the actual physical uh, theatres, I would probably agree the smaller ones are uh, slightly more intense because you can really see the people's eyes. You can you're really communicating with them, but not necessarily bad intense because um, if you're having a really nice moment and a really you're sharing the music with people, I think in an intimate setting nothing really beats that because it's a very special thing yeah. you can really see people see people's reactions directly whereas <clears throat> as if you're playing in front of thousands of people or hundreds of people um that's still lovely as well and you've kind of got this group uh kind of um herd energy coming off the the, the the crowd which is incredible but it's perhaps more about the group rather than individual uh people and communicating with individual people yeah so, yeah yeah, I totally agree. And I, I've sometimes thought, and, and that's what, one of the, the crazy things about being a traditional musician is that you can, one like you say, you can one day you could be playing in front of thousands of people and the very next day playing in front of, in front of 40 people without a PA system. And there's both equally uh, enjoyable experiences for their, for their own reasons. Um, yeah. So you, you've mentioned your band a couple of times, your own band. Who Who's in the band? What do they play? And why... Did you choose those people and those instruments? Yeah, so I'm really lucky to have a, a, a little family. I definitely see it like a little family of of musicians who 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 I play with, um, and uh, a lot of the time I'm playing with a great double bass player called Jan Lubozic, um, a sitern player. Uh, sitern, for those of you who don't know, it's a bit like a bazooki or a bit like a a, a large mandolin, <clears throat> an octave mandolin. Sylvain Kerry, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, I've kind of got this group, this family, and depending on who's available or depending where we're playing, I can um, I can shout different people to come and join me, and um, that's always based on um, myself on 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 pipes and, and flutes, and then a bazooki or a sitern. That's my kind of number one favorite. Yeah. Uh, accompanying accompanying instrument for the pipes and the flute for sure. Um, we can talk about that later. And then double bass. I think the double bass is fantastic because um, um, I, I was I was brought up in, in Murray, Speyside, where there's a massive, massive uh, fiddle tradition. So, of course, a, a double bass isn't a fiddle, but when, when the double bass player uses the bow, sometimes you get this lovely kind of thick uh, bowed sound. And it just It's a little kind of um, tip of the hat to, to the fiddle, as well as being... Uh, as as long as as well as reinforcing the kind of the the bass lines and the chord sequences, when you get the sitern or the bazooki and the bass really tight together, it's uh, yeah, it's just it's great. It's really powerful. Yeah. yeah, so I quite often find myself in 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 a trio setup, um, and then as often as possible with um, with a dancer, step dancer, because I I find that's a fantastic. Um, it's like the the next dimension again. <laughs> You've got the yeah. the 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 
the the cherry on the cake in terms of like the the drum kit i kind of see my band as a bit like a drum kit you know everyone's got their their job to do and if we all do it right it it, it should kind of come together in this rhythmic uh unity and having the the step dancing um mic'd up and and um linked in synced in with everybody else it's just fantastic and of course the visual element of dancing is 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 really important to traditional music i think quite often we've lost that back in the day you know it was all about dancing kayleys getting people up on their feet and um uh you know for jigs and reels and those type of tunes so having an actual dancer who's musically and sonically in like uh offering something to the table but as well visually it kind of brings the music to life in a way that uh you can't really do when you're when you're just playing music <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's in, that's interesting that the first thing you said the first thing you you link the dancing into because when as soon as you say dance most people it, it immediately think of the visual element but your first mention was for the the rhythmical musical element of the feet uh, hitting the ground and and being a percussive instrument as part of the band. So, yeah. so your your dancer is uh, a member of the band and a, a visual element at the same time. Not that, yeah, not well, that actually, you guys are. Re but. Really. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, it, it definitely feels like a band when we're when we're all on the road or yeah. doing concerts and things like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, like I said, very lucky to have these lots lots of different people who are who are who are available at different times to 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 come in and play play my music really um and obviously you you you've grown up in the you grew up in the the northeast of england with that has its own dance tradition like clog dancing and um and all sorts so i think every 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 country or every area has its has its own type of dancing obviously the the, the irish step dancing is very famous yeah um worldwide um, the Scottish step dancing is fantastic it's kind of closer to the floor and and definitely linked in more with the the, the rhythms of the tunes or the songs um so yeah yeah i, I love i love uh, working with dancers for yeah, sure. yeah it's great i mean yeah my my mum uh did clog dancing when i was when i was little so it's one, one of the things that uh that i just remember my dad playing the tin whistle and my mum dancing to it it was uh yeah it, it does it gives you a kind of perspective on what the tunes are for very early on and uh and, and that it's very much a, a dance music. For sure. So you're a Scottish yeah, yeah. folk musician, but you live in Brittany and you have done for a long time. So how, how have you kind of held on to or developed your identity as a Scottish musician from afar? So, I mean, during COVID, it was, it was during COVID times, like for everybody, it was really hard. We couldn't travel around as freely as, uh, uh, as we would have liked to have done. But, um, yeah, I I definitely find myself between Brittany, principally in Scotland, where where's home, um, depending on the work and um, going back to see family and and um, so I kind of find myself between the two places, um, but yeah, like I said, playing 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 this music definitely helps to stay rooted for sure, um, and um, yeah, no matter no matter where you are, if you've got if you've got that in your in your head or in your in your heart, uh, I think that does definitely keep you grounded and and uh, and and gets you through it. Brittany and um, Scotland uh, are really not very far apart at all. So um, as long as as long as there are trains and boats and flights which are not too expensive, um, travelling between the two places quite regularly as I do is is, uh, is not a problem. Do you, when you say not far apart, do you mean culturally or uh, distance wise? Well, both. Yeah. Well, both obviously, like uh, Brittany is kind of the northwest of uh, of France, a bit like a mirror image to Cornwall in in uh, um, in England. And uh, culturally, I suppose, yeah, that people quite often talk about Celt the Celtic nations. I'm I'm going to be very careful about that because it can mean different things to different people. Um, the word Celtic, but, yeah. uh, if you take if you take it kind of as it is today, and what people perce perceive Celtic to mean today, and um, the Celtic nations, you know, um, which can be a bit exclusive, uh, exclusive, I find it excludes some places, which is a shame. Um, talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, Brittany, um, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, you know, Northumberland as well. Um, I think they, they share a lot of the main, the same ideas and um, sentiments. So although the music or the instruments may be slightly different, you know, we've all got pipes, 
we've all got fiddles, but the way you play them is maybe slightly different. Um, the idea behind the music is is kind of the same, really. You've got long, slow ballads which tell stories, and they were the kind of the the blockbuster films of the day. The you know um, uh, passing on interesting or made up stories, entertainment, <clears throat> and then you've also got the dance tunes um, to get people. Uh, socialising and 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 moving and keeping morale up. So I think all of these different places, Galicia as well, Asturias, um, Isle of Man, of course, uh, all these places share those those same elements. Yeah. So do you do you find any of the the kind of elements of Bre- Breton music creeping into your own music, or have you kind of stayed very focused on the Scottish side of things? I think I, I love I love all types of. Celtic music, um, as I do rock or <laughs> jazz or classical music, baroque music. I love all these types of music. So um, I think it's impossible to deny any of these influences. If you're listening to other types of music or speaking to other people or speaking to other musicians, it's impossible to deny that they might have some influence in in uh, in your own thoughts or your own music. Um, but I don't think there's a direct influence from Breton music in my music at all. <clears throat> I think sometimes the colours or 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 the ideas, um, or perhaps even the tunes that you 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 hear and you come across when you're travelling around or you're doing festivals and things like that. I think they probably def- they probably creep in. But um, yeah, my own music is definitely rooted in Scottish and uh, of course Irish music as well. Yeah, yeah. Playing the Illan pipes, um, which are. Yeah, which are definitely considered an Irish instrument. It's something I have to talk about pretty much every time I, <laughs> I bet get you on do, stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, or on Facebook, people are people are uh, are asking about this, and you know, yeah. uh, what's yeah. what's going on? What's you know, they're not Scottish pipes. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> like, we'll uh, talk about that uh, as well. I promise. But um, yeah, to, just to to kind of stay on the the Breton thing. So you, um, you live you live in Brittany, but that's purely for family reasons then it it wasn't necessarily the music of Brittany that caused you to end up moving there well um i originally went over to well i i have to say that i i as a as a child came over to to france quite a few times with um with my family so i already kind of knew um i'd already been over here quite a few times before um my mother um is a french teacher um, so I always had the, had the kind of the language in, in the house as well. Ah. Initially, I came over for for a short break, really a kind of a holiday, and just to just to sort of check it out and to to, to hear a bit of Breton music, fiznos, and and things like that. I ended up staying for a long time, um, but yeah, I think it's fair to say I'm definitely between Scotland and Brittany. Do you, do you think living outside of Scotland gives you a unique? view and feel for Scottish music that maybe people who've stayed in Scotland wouldn't develop? Um, I think, well, I, I, I kind of share my time between Scotland and Brittany, I have to say that, but like I I find that if you're, if you're a travelling musician, wherever you're based, I, I'm sure you're, you're hearing other groups and, and, um, and bands um, and other traditions and that must creep its way into your idea folder somewhere in your head. Yeah. So yeah, I think as long as you're traveling, as long as you're meeting other people, that's the main thing, regardless of where you're, where you're based really. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's something um, that, that I decided a long time ago. It doesn't actually matter where, yeah. where you're based as a musician, because you always have to be somewhere else to, to do your job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you get back, do you get back to, uh, to the Northeast of England quite a lot um, or whenever you can? Not as much as I'd like to, because my family have now moved to Scotland. In fact, as it happens, <laughs> so I, so when I go over, are they not on the west coast? Are they? Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I tend yeah. when I do get back, I, I tend to go there. But um, yeah, traveling's mm. become sort of slightly more difficult and tricky, just for for a lot of different reasons. Some of them are in the news, and some of them aren't. But um, uh, have haven't been back for quite a while. But looking forward to the next next yeah. next trip back, and I do I do miss the area, and I do also. Um, the, you know, when I'm playing Northumbrian tunes or singing yeah. Northumbrian songs, it does transport me back to those places where I was as a small child. And I do, it, yeah. it's not, you know, it, it's not some kind of romantic thing made up for the audience. It really does uh, take me back mm. to those places and give me the feel of that particular type of sunlight that comes in off the North Sea, you know, your East Coast as well. So you, yeah. you'll know that kind of sunlight that you only get there 
and the, there's something about the magic and that's definitely in the music and i think with scottish music as well i had a tape of scottish music someone gave me once and i was driving to scotland and it just felt so right to be listening to these these scottish kaylee dance tunes driving through the scottish landscape yeah. it just made so much sense even though there's no yeah. there's no reason why it should there's nothing in the music that explicitly says this is scotland but somehow it just feels that way so yeah i totally yeah. get what you're well, talking north, about north north umbrian music and and scottish music irish music they're very, they're all very very close i, I suppose yeah aren't they yeah, I think so. You know, people people like to sort of separate them off and, and ring fence their bit, and that makes sense as well. It gives you something to concentrate mm. on, to relate to. But I think for outsiders, you know, we both live in countries outside, sort of slightly outside of those traditions, and uh, people don't hear the difference so much. They, they're they confused, you know, yeah. is, is this Irish music or what, what is this? What do you mean English music or Scottish music? And I suppose that's yeah. inevitable, really, that the as you sometimes zoom out, people, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the people in, in, in the tradition themselves, like my, you know, ourselves included, so, yeah. sometimes it's quite hard to explain what it is as well, because there's so many subdivisions as well, you know, like yeah. uh, there's as much difference between different uh, traditions within Ireland, for example, the Sleeve Lucre part yeah. of uh, Ireland, um, and then Donegal, if you take the, the two extremes, maybe the kind of uh, ge ge geographically, um, quite a lot of similarities between Donegal music and, and Scottish music, and it goes both ways. You know, West Coast Scottish music and the, the music from the Hebrides, and uh, bo music from the borders, touching on Northumbria, um, Northumberland, and then like northeast of Scotland music. They, they, there's sometimes as much difference between those things as there are between kind of Scottish, Irish, Northumbrian, Welsh, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Um, absolutely. I never, I never, I never b batted an eyelid at. Um, at at borrowing the the Ilan pipes just because I thought they sounded really nice and I loved the sound and so I never I never really thought much about it but uh, it's it's something which are almost on a daily basis on online or on 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 Facebook or at, in in concerts and things like that someone will um, usually people who live quite far away from the kind of home tradition so usually people who are not in Ireland or or Scotland uh, usually will will kind of be very surprised that a Scottish person is playing uh, the Ilan pipes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't, but I didn't bat an eyelid at yeah. it when I was younger. So, so, so if you had to, right? The, I think the Ilan pipes kind of developed in in Scotland, Northumberland, London, and Ireland as a, as a kind of it was like a project, wasn't it? It was an instrument that sort of developed over time. That's my understanding of it. Well, anyway. I'm going to be very, very careful yeah. because I've like a little bit of knowledge in this subject yeah. can get you in an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> Pipe, <laughs> I, pipes is I, a I'm dangerous, a dangerous subject. Yeah, <laughs> it's for some reason the ba like bagpipes as a family of instruments yeah. are incredibly like ingrained in national feeling, yeah. and people can get very, very precious and and not precious. That's the wrong word. People can get very kind of um, protective, defensive about defensive. things. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, if you took yeah. I've got to be very careful with what I say because I think when my young younger days uh, that 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 interested me a lot. For me, they're just an inst they're like just an instrument like any other instrument, and I yeah. love the sound of them. This the the sound of them pipes just um, grew up with it, and it really just like it, it sung to me when I was a kid, and 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 it's just like a voice which I can express myself with, and um, so the whole kind of national flag waving banner thing is not really my thing. However. The ancestor of the uh, of the modern Ilan pipes is an instrument called the the pastoral pipe, which you'll know all about. Um, which yes, it was they had kind of these pockets of um, uh, craftsmen or luthiers who were who were making those um, in Northumberland. I think it was the the Reed the Reed brothers maybe in Northumberland in London as well in Dublin of course um, in Belfast um, in all the kind of big. Uh, cultural centres, Aberdeen as well. Yeah, there's actually an, an old set, an old set of. Uh, I think they called them union pipes because they changed names quite a few times. Uh, pastoral pipes, and then they became like the the union pipes and the grand union pipes, and then the Illan pipes or Irish pipes, the the Irish organ, you know, all sorts of different names. Um, so some of them were made up in Aberdeen. There's a fantastic, beautiful example of of a set of pipes made up in Aberdeen. Um, quite a few examples made in in uh, in and around uh, Newcastle, uh, North or South Shields. I can't quite remember. 
um, Dublin, of course, Cana, the, the big the big makers were 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 over in Ireland as well, um, and then with uh, emigration to the the to the states, the the concert pitch instrument became um, more popular. Uh, much much later, actually, it's based on the original instrument, but kind of made louder, uh, larger tone holes, a bit more of a raucous sound to fill uh, theatres and and um, music halls, and um, yeah. It's like I said. It's it's the 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 sound of the Northumbrian pipes for, for for you and for for a lot of people must just sound like home. And you're hearing a, a, a full set of Ill, Illin pipes playing. People just automatically think of of Ireland. Yeah. Hearing the Highland pipes, you're going to think of Scotland. Absolutely. As a as a, as a I, I write a few tunes as well. I mean, you're writing tunes and you're 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 trying to portray something. It's something which I've. I've struggled with and probably continue to struggle with a lot. It's 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 people's perception of your music, um, because of the sound of the instrument. You know, if you take a flute for example, or um, a fiddle, they're they're almost kind of like uh, neutral instruments. You can do whatever you want with them. You can play Scottish music, Irish music, Northumbrian music, Welsh music, and depending on how you play it that'll give you the style and that'll give you the sound. You know, if you hear somebody from the northeast, like Paul Anderson, for example, fantastic fiddler from the, the northeast of Scotland, you hear him playing some Strath's bass, you're like, wow, we're in Scotland. We're yeah. Out, like, <laughs> you know, well, that, we're I in suppose, bank, yeah, we're in yeah, banker. That's, that's, that's the usual thing with instruments, isn't it? If you take a guitar, you can you can play death metal on it or you can play classical music. Or yeah. You, I mean, obviously, slightly different types of guitar, but... Or you can on an electric guitar you can play soul music or rock music or or jazz yeah and it's just the way you play it but but the, yeah there is something about bagpipes and maybe the thing with the, yeah. the island pipes is that what really made them the Irish pipes was the fact that the people who really sort of decided made made the the, the sound and the repertoire and the playing style were the Irish in the end and that that's why we think of Ireland when we hear that instrument. So you, oh, for sure, you've, you've yeah. got your work cut out for you to make it sound Scottish. <laughs> so you obviously enjoy a well, challenge. Well, do you know, uh, Andrew? I, I kind of, I, I never really had that in mind, and if 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 that ever crossed my mind, I lost that um, that idea a long time ago. I think yeah. I just love the sound of them, and I'm happy if people want to say that, it, that they they they're Irish. They are Irish. They're considered as Irish, yeah. and, and the instrument was almost lost completely. And it was thanks to um, many makers in Ireland and the developments they made and the and the, and the sort of traditions over there that the, the instrument still exists for sure. They're very much an Irish instrument, so I, I'm not on a, some sort of quest to sort of make them Scottish at all. I just love the sound of them, and yeah, of course, I wish that they were slightly more neutral in terms of people's perception of what country they're coming from. Um, not wanting not wanting to take that away from Ireland at all, and just in terms of, a, of being a. a a kind of composer writing music and um, performing, it would be nice that if if they if I had a bit more of a clean slate, but you know you can't have everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you've got a beautiful instrument to play, so that's a that's a, a great thing in itself. Right, since we're talking about the Illin pipes, um, would you mind showing us them and demonstrating what? On earth yeah, for this sure. Is yeah. We're talking about. <laughs> So I'm just in, I'm in the corner of my my little studio here. Uh, so I've got all my instruments at hand. So um, for those of you who who don't know, the Ellen pipes um, have these bellows. You strap these bellows round your waist. Um, so here they are. Here are my Ellen pipes. And so this is the bag, and you can blow the air into that using the bellows. Just plug it all in. So once I'm strapped in. Um, the, the bag fills up there. And then um, just a quick explanation, there are basically three parts to the instrument. The main part is the um, the chanter, and that's the part that plays the melody a bit like a flute does or a whistle does, and that sounds uh, like this. Lovely. So there we go. One of the very important parts of the instrument is the or are the drones and they give you a long constant uh, pitch with which to, to play along to. So if I put the drones on, I don't know if you can hear that. Um, Certainly can. <laughs> that gives a kind of accompaniment to the, to the tune. <laughs> And 
And then the last part of the instrument, this is really what makes the, the, the Irish pipes or the, the Illan pipes unique, is that it has these regulators, we call these regulators, and uh, these are like keyed chanters, which you can press using your, it's actually this hand, the, the inside of your wrist and, the, and your inside of your hand, and that kind of gives you extra notes, a bit like double stopping on the violin. So if I was to play everything together, Fantastic. There we go. Yeah. So you don't actually need a band, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you can do it all yourself. <laughs> well, uh, it's always nice to have the guys on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I happen to know that you played the flute before you played the pipes. So um, did you find that you could transfer your flute skills onto the chanter of the pipes? Or was that quite a big change for you? So to start at the very beginning, I actually started playing, um, it wasn't this exact instrument, but it was an instrument very, very like this. And that's, that's what I started uh, playing traditional music on anyway, uh, Penny Whistle. So, um, Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do and I started on the penny whistle as well so <laughs> did you yeah, yeah I didn't know that I think many That's people great. did yeah so I, yeah this is good for traveling you can just put it in your jacket and yeah. just tra travel around so I started on that whistle actually I, uh, yeah. my sister very kindly lent me one of her whistles and um, kind of got bitten by the bug really and then from then onwards um, I went on to the, the flute and the pipes I've always kind of played the um, all these instruments kind of in unison uh, at the same time, really, I've, there's been periods where I've uh, done more than others. So perhaps where we we uh, met and knew each other best from, um, I was doing a lot of stuff on the flute. Yeah. Um, so people often kind of, different people sort of latch on to different things. So some people consider me as a piper, some people kind of consider me as a flute player, but they're, they're definitely, uh, they've always definitely been there in parallel. And depending on where I am, I've spent a bit more time on one or the other, but ah, things right. have evened off now and I've managed to <laughs> figure out a way in my head to uh, to kind of play the two. I, th I think I definitely spend more time playing pipes uh, live and I, I really enjoy that sound, but um, to break up the, the, the pipe sets in a concert, for example, or on a CD, I, I love going back to the flute as well, for sure. And... Um, uh, yeah, especially playing Scottish music on the on the flute, I think you, there's a bit more of a clean slate to do that. You, there's there's more room for articulating the instrument in a way which um, means you can you can make it more uh, more of your own and more Scottish. I think po possibly. Yeah. Would you Would you mind so, giving us a demonstration of 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 the instrument yeah. and also what you mean about making it sound Scottish? That would be very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my wooden flute. Um, <laughs> Uh, made of wood, obviously, with with uh, brass keys, and um, yeah, it sounds a bit like this. Hey, yeah, transported to northern Scotland there, definitely. Northeast Scotland, <laughs> <laughs> Strathspey. Yeah, so yeah, I see what, I instantly knew what you meant there because when you started playing Strathspey, it's it's the gaps between, it's the gaps between the notes that make it that style. 
which obviously pipes. Oh, yeah, although with Ilan pipes, you can do gaps between notes. Yeah, Strathspeys work great on the Ilan pipes as yeah. well. Um, actually, just uh, finished recording a new solo album, which might actually be out by the time this video is online. Um, so, uh, when, yeah, when does it come out then? When does it come out? End of February, something like that. Yeah. And yeah, there's lots, lots of marches, uh, Strathspeys um, played on the Ilan pipes. <laughs> so, what, what's the album called? The album is called True North, and um, this is maybe a little bit of a kind of uh, continuation with uh, the last album was called Tr uh, Tales from the North, and that was all about um, a lot, obviously a lot of traditional Scottish music, some Irish music as well, um, but a lot of um, new tunes written about old places or old legends or, pl or old stories from the north of Scotland, the Highlands, Speyside, um, so it's a continuation in that way. Uh, I think we were talking about this before, about a sense of place when you're playing music. And um, yeah, definitely transported and have that in my head and my, my mind when I'm, when I'm playing this music. So the, the North part of it is, is, is very important, really. True North, obviously, that can mean different things to different people. It can mean the t geographical North, but also um, finding your true North is kind of like finding your direction also in life. Yeah. So um, it has all these ideas in this album. The album is um, is is rooted around uh, the performing trio, the band. So there's double bass, sitern, and uh, myself on on pipes and flute. Um, so we we mostly find ourselves in that lineup. So it felt the truest form of uh, musical expression was to was to go back to that trio. So there's no overdubs. There's no like uh, fifty guests or like. Um, bagpipe band or brass band or electric <laughs> guitars or, or shakers or anything like that. It's just like it's what we yeah. do live basically. That's what it is. So kind of true uh, sort of pure delivery of the music. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I look, I look forward to hearing that. And that's quite in contrast to some of the other stuff that you've done as, as, as you say as a hired gun. Um, one of the things that I've, I found particularly interesting and uh, must have been an exciting thing to try was your stuff working with orchestras in big studios in London, Abbey Road and Air Studios, recording, was it London Symph Symphony Orchestra? Was that right? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to, 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 to be invited to do a whole bunch of different things um, with different orchestras. So there was uh, London Phil, uh, yeah. members of the London Phil, London um, Symphony as well, uh, Scottish Chamber Orchestra, um, uh, and sometimes do sort of quartet things as well, sort of yeah. more reduced lineups as well. Um, yeah, th this this type of work is something which I really enjoy, um, but it kind of comes along. You can never predict when it'll come along. I mean, I yeah. might never do any more of it. <laughs> I hope I do, <laughs> but I, I might never do any more of it. It yeah. just kind of suddenly comes along and then you might get three calls or three uh, gigs doing that in one month and then nothing yeah. for two years so uh, there's no sort of predicting um yeah so when you uh, do get, get the call like you when you got the call to play on was it the hobbit soundtrack yeah, yeah so, so um, what what, ha hobbit... what happens and how how do you <laughs> what, what goes through your head when you get invited to to, to go oh. and do something like that well i tell you this this is uh this is me being completely honest about this experience um so the, the the music that I recorded uh, didn't actually make it onto the the um, the film. Uh, it might it might be it might be on the director's cut, but it's on the um, the soundtrack. So um, I was in Abbey Road Studios, which is obviously a very famous studio's main studio, uh, Studio One, which is one of the few studios where you can actually fit a symphony orchestra because they're massive, like yeah. with all the the ba bass horns and all the timps and everything. Um, uh, so we spent about four days recording different versions of a handful of tracks. Um, I think these films are so uh, so big budget they can afford to have different versions or different choices for each moment in the film. Right. So, um, yeah, the bit that I recorded, the bit which made it onto the soundtrack was, I think it's called Erebor. And if you have the soundtrack for The um, the Hobbit, you'll hear the pipes in that. Um so we did different versions of that, different lengths of it as well, like to mm -hmm. to to 
which were being sent to um, the director at the time. That's <laughs> like exciting. In, 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 in live live streaming, basically wow. sending them to the director, and then he'd say like, "Oh, um, is it Peter Jackson? Is it Peter Jackson? Yeah, it must have been. I think. Director. I think so. Yeah." Um, and uh, and then no, that's too short or that's too long or can you make that a bit more like this or make like that and then suddenly you'd have the the um, the secretary of the orchestra coming around and giving you more or different uh, manuscripts, different pieces of music to so, to then play. So were they, were adapted. these prepared in advance? Did they have like a stack of notation just in case the director wants it twenty seconds shorter or are they there on a computer editing uh, yeah. the score? Yeah, in real yeah, time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty it, was, high pressure. it was one of the most. It was what. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'd I'd obviously done a little bit playing with um, uh, orchestras or kind of classical music musicians a wee bit before. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. I've got to be honest. Then one day I just find myself in Abbey Road Studios in London for the first time. It's the first time I'd been there. This is this is going back quite a few years now. <clears throat> in Abbey Road Studios for the first time, London Phil for the first time. Um, yeah in live streaming to the director, like massive, massive big deal. Um, and it wasn't like I was in a little room <laughs> at the side of the uh, of the studio, like isolated and just recording the pipes on my own. That would have been uh, much more zen, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, I was placed, um, if you were going to place an Ellen pipe, if, if every orchestra had an Ellen, Ellen pipes in it, Which they where should. would you place it? Which they should. <laughs> Uh, I was placed between the oboe and the flutes. That made sense yeah. to me. So, yeah. uh, but I was right in the middle of the orchestra, like right in the middle of the whole orchestra, with the horns behind me, the the wind section, the, the cellos to my right hand side. It was just, um, it was incredible, and yeah, baptism of fire. I think is the uh, expression in at the deep end straight away, and um, yeah, that's probably been like the high, most high profile intensity experience to to this day so far yeah so so you, so you say in at the deep end so you you basically had to adjust your i mean we had, we had this little bit in the previous podcast i did which was with melanie rothman who's a an oboe player yeah. orchestral oboe player but also plays pipes on the side and for her it was the the adjustment <coughs> was to play by ear and to be totally free and and that that was weird for her to, to do the folk way of doing mm. things which is almost the opposite of the classical way so presumably oh, for absolutely. you 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 generally play by ear so you're you're arriving in this classical setting where where there's a fixed arrangement made by a a, a great classical composer a conductor so how how on earth did you uh, adjust to that situation well it was a very uh swift learning progress um <laughs> you know learning curve was was very very quick um i soon discovered um for example when you're talking about on the, on being on the beat and the way that conductors are, are are counting time and things like that because you've got a whole orchestra which is you know the physical space which an orchestra might take up that size might be not exaggerating even if you're sitting quite close to each other you're talking like sort of 15 meters maybe or yeah, I would say maybe up to fifty meters from the from the orc, from the the conductor at the front, going right the way back to the the horns or the timps at right at the back. You're talking yeah. there's a big physical distance. You know what I mean? Yeah. So getting everybody to play in time, um, uh, you know that took that took getting used to for for everybody. I think it's worth saying that every orchestra and every every ensemble has its own. You know, string quartets, for example, they they spend years trying to gel and and. Uh, uh, honing in on their own tuning and their own rhythms and stuff like that you can it's not necessarily like a kind of a copy and paste you can't just take one person from another and stick them in yeah. of course you could do and that'll work great but the best ones stick together for a long long time and they really work together and they understand everyone's perception of the beat and like okay that f sharp for that uh, key signature is it a little bit flat or a bit sharp or just to kind of get it all singing and stuff so there's all these things to consider um in an orchestra because you've got like dozens and dozens and dozens of people the rhythm thing for me was the biggest thing because in trad music, traditional music, <clears throat> you know, we're just used to kind of uh, letting it go, like the sparks and the fire, just like driving tunes forward, yeah. possibly being, um, you know, pushing the beat forward. If basically, if you're if you're keeping things the same speed all the time, it sounds like they're going, they're getting slower almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, if if you were to record a set of reels to a click track, uh, 
and the click track didn't move and it was staying at 110 or 115 or 20 or whatever it is, 130 if you're, if you're up for it. Um, uh, and it's to stay at the same speed all the way through. I think sometimes that sounds like you're, it's not going anywhere. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not exciting. You know what I mean? It needs to push forward a wee bit. It needs to kind of get a yeah. little bit faster and stuff like that. Yeah. Getting everyone to play in time was, was a, was a, was a learning curve um, because quite often <clears throat> a classical musicians I found uh, without wanting to be too general, um, to take the conductor's signal for the one to be almost like a kind of a, a guide with when to start. Whereas yeah. I would, I, I was, and have to sort of consciously make an effort not to be when I'm playing with classical musicians. I'm like, when he goes like that, I'm like, I'm like, on it. Whereas with classical musicians, it might be more of a kind of fade in, you know, with the, with the long, long, lovely strings and, and things. Yeah. It might be more of a kind of like a rum, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Little things like that, really. Uh, the way people talk about things, their expressions, the 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 way they talk about the like the vocabulary for music and things might differ slightly. Um, but I have to say, each experience I've had has been completely different. Each director or composer has been different, and um, yeah, it's always a massive learning curve and yeah, something yeah. I really enjoy doing. Did you get a chance to talk to like the first time you worked with an orchestra? Did you get a chance to talk to the conductor <coughs> first and just get some heads up on 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 how it works? <clears throat> or, or did you just get shown to your seat and it started? Well, I do that now for sure. Yeah, yeah I think I feel like I've. Uh, I think that helps the whole thing work a bit better if 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 you make yourself known and just yeah. have a little chat with everyone and stuff like that. For that first experience, it was it was the first thing I'd done, and so I just got I, I was just shown to my seat, and I was like, "All oh, right, I'm playing like." <laughs> With with the orchestra, like in the orchestra, you know what I mean? like, <laughs> wow, yeah, amazing uh, feeling. But now, oh, it was yeah, amazing. But now, yeah, yeah, I think now with with more experience doing that kind of thing, I would, um, you know, I'm, I, there's not fifty other Alan Pipers in that room. I'm the one who's they've called to do that job. Yeah. You know, yeah. of course, there's lots of other Alan Pipers in the scene who can do who can do this as well. You know, it's not it's just an exclusive thing to me. You know. If, Eric Riggler is the kind of the king of this. He 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 was recording Ellen Pipes for films and and uh, with orchestras, you know, back in back in the day for Braveheart and all this. Yeah. He's like the kind of uh, the original uh, movie guy, really. So, <laughs> but I mean, there's loads loads of us who can do it now. Yeah. But uh, when when I'm actually there, they haven't got three or four Ellen Pipers. They've just got me. So it's important that you kind of you hold your ground and you kind of say, okay. This is what I've got. This is what I can do, and you you really understand the the dialogue which is going on. Otherwise, um, you can kind of uh, find yourself getting um, pushed along or put in a position where you're not delivering the best that you that you can do. So, um, for example, I always ask to uh, have the like a demo of the music or or um, like a recording of the music as as early as possible, so I can get it into my head and I can yeah, really. Yeah get get off the page um whereas a lot of the 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 orchestral musicians or session musicians who are classical musicians they might come in having just had their breakfast and not even not even know what they're doing that day or not uh, have never seen or heard the music ever yeah and of course they come down and they read the music and it's perfect you know <laughs> yeah. yeah but i suppose the point is the composers who write for orchestras know the the the, the standard orchestral instruments inside out so they know what well, yeah, an oboe player would expect to be given, whereas presumably your average, if you can even use that phrase, average uh, orchestral composer doesn't really deal with the Illin pipes much and has maybe ne never even seen them in real life. And maybe the other well, people yeah, in the orchestra. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was the reaction of the other people in the orchestra when you came in and strapped on your, your pipes? Well, yeah, lo lots of things to to, to re re reply to there. Uh, first thing, yeah, most most composers do know, or you know, they've read up on it. I, yeah. I did a, th a thing a thing during lockdown for a composer, and he'd actually taken lessons on the Ilan pipes wow. um, to un to understand them better, so he could write better for them. And what he'd written was fantastic. So, yeah, um, you know, even all the grace notes and stuff like that was written in. So I just that was very easy and, and intuitive to play. Yeah, and um, sometimes. Uh, sometimes other other composers maybe haven't quite understood the way that the, the, the instrument is capable of jumping up the octaves or the slurs or the um, the slides 
and the range of the instrument. Sometimes it's written for instruments which are, or, or the notes are written lower than the, the range is possible. So you have to fold those up. Um, yeah. Little things like that. So I, it's not always possible, but sometimes, uh, well, I always try and get the music before so I can really work at it and, and, and then suggest something back and say, how's this? Do you like this? This is what I can do. Um, yeah. Does that suit you? And there's a bit of discourse going on. And and the other thing I I, I feel I have to ask and I'm genuinely really interested in is uh, it's a, it's a dream for almost all musicians, whatever kind of music, uh, to record Abbey Road. You know, it's where the Beatles recorded their most famous stuff, and so mm. all the the big film soundtracks have been recorded. What what was that experience like? Was it like any other studio? Was it just a bigger version of any other studio, or was there something special about recording there? Uh, yeah, it was very special. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Abbey Road. So the first time I was there was in Studio One, which is the biggest studio. Yeah, the f I think the first thing to say is that they're just really, really well equipped with lots of lovely gear. So like all the the, the microphones are, are old, um, old microphones going back. They've been tried and tested. Everything just sounds yeah. lovely. The acoustic is great. Um, the engineers just really know what they're doing. There's no faffing around. There's no egos at all. Everyone's just yeah. very cool. Everyone's in there just to do a job and they just get on with it. Um, it's really, really nice, actually. Very pleasant experience. There's none of this kind of, um, you know, there's no nonsense, really. It's just it's very like, much about Do work. you know who I am? <laughs> none of that stuff. No. <laughs> No, absolutely oh, not. Nice. No, yeah, it, nice it's very know. much a kind of working atmosphere, and everyone's everyone's kind of on a level, which is great. Um, so I've recorded in in uh, Studio One, which is the big one, which they usually do the orchestral stuff, and I've also done yeah. Studio Two, which is where a lot of the Beatles stuff was done. Yeah. Um, and if I've understood correctly, I think they haven't they haven't changed a lot of the stuff in there because it it may influence the sound. So, for example, the the the, the panels on the wall. These are all original. You know what I mean. A lot of the a lot yeah. of the stuff which is in the room is just original stuff. They haven't changed yeah. it or updated it. They wouldn't need to. But it smells old. When you go into Studio Two, it smells old. Yeah. It's like you go and you're like, oh, I'm in this. I'm in the sixties. You know what I mean? <laughs> Literally, it's it's amazing. It, and it, then um, John, John Lennon's cigarette smoke is still s sort of coming yeah. out of the walls. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you know, like when you go to your, your grandparents' house or something like that, and, and it has that kind of old smell. I don't mean like in a bad way. I mean a lovely yeah. kind of like comforting, like old, like old clocks and like yeah. old wood and like leather and all that kind of stuff. It just smelled a bit like that, really. Uh, very comforting, actually. I've got to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other another studio we're talking about would be um, would be Air Studios, which is an old um, abbey. I think it is uh, a religious building. I think I think it's an abbey. Which is which has been converted into a studio. Now that was just that was insane. That was insane. I was doing some music for um, a video game, uh, and they have a kind of system where they can bring this like uh, the the roof level down. Obviously, it's not the actual roof. It's a kind of covering or a dampening thing, which is the same size as the roof basically, and bring it down. Yeah. To, to make to give a kind of closer sound or take it up and then you can benefit from the, the lovely natural reverb resonances from the room that was insane and then actually the bit i recorded the kind of solo the little snippet solo i uh, recorded for that particular project they put me up on the balcony you know a lot, a lot of um churches or abbeys have a kind of balcony where you can sit at the top yeah they actually put me up there to record it <laughs> And so the whole acoustic was like, wow! In in the in the, that's not a, that's not a kind of electronic uh, reverb. That's the actual reverb from from there. Yeah, so that was that was pretty insane. So you've got um, a big French tour coming up in March, where where you're playing sort of almost every day for for quite a, well. You you tell us how how long, <laughs> how how big is yeah, this tour? So it's pretty impressive. Two thousand and twenty-three. Um, I've got a uh, launch of the new album, True North, which might even be out by the time this, this video airs. <laughs> um, doing doing a handful of concerts with, with my own band. More of those are coming in just now, so people can look at those on my website. As well as that, I'm uh, part of this new adventure um, with a project called uh, Heritage, or Gold, Goldman Heritage, and in Francophone, sort of French-speaking uh, parts of the world, people will have heard of He's a household name, uh, Jean-Jacques Goldman, who wrote uh, many, many fantastic songs. He's a real household name, you know, pop pop artist, pop rock artist. And his songs are fantastic. They're really good. So I'm part of this project, which is uh, taking um, 
modern singers who are in the, the scene at the moment um, redoing his songs and, and performing these again all over all over France. So, so have you been um, brought in to do his vocals or, or what's your... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to be singing in French. Uh... <laughs> Stands to reason. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so part part of the kind of the new, um, the new slant on his songs, he, he'd always had traditional kind of uh, folk melodies as part of his songs. You know, you, you, if you listen to some of his songs, they're these big, massive pop production songs but then there'll be a little motif here and there or like a little guitar line or maybe it'll be doubled up with some pipes or a flute or something like that so there's, they've, there's always been this little pinch of uh, Celtic or traditional music in his music I think you know yeah, yeah. and um, so I'm there to really kind of uh, make that even more present. Yeah and you've got pedigree in, in that sense because you've also performed quite for quite a few years with Ange- Angelo Kelly and family who mm-hmm. in 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 Germany, in particular, uh, are, are extremely famous um, performers. Yeah. So you, you've you've been, I mean, you've been on all the big TV shows. You've played at huge huge venues with them. So what um, is that a different way of approaching playing music when you when you're um, basically playing pop music on on but bringing a folk element in? Is that a different yeah, feeling? Yeah, I think it is. Um, f- feelings maybe not the right word. Different hat, like a different, yeah. a different job. You know, not always, but sometimes you're you're kind of you've got the role of a guitarist almost. You know, like a lead guitarist. I've yeah. uh, you sort of doing these really like screeching, soaring electric guitar solo or these riffs and things like that um, on the pipes, which I think the the pipes kind of give that yeah tip of the hat towards electric guitar sound when they're when they're when they're mic'd up and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. You can you can be finding yourselves in roles like that. Sometimes the pop project or the the, the classical project wants you to be there and be a kind of uh, really there to be kind of bringing the, the traditional vibe into that. So it could be that you're you're actually playing tunes, you're playing traditional tunes or composed yeah. tunes which are supposed to sound like traditional tunes. And um, so that's the kind of the traditional part of it. To be perfectly honest with you, I love doing both. However, I think I love doing when I'm doing pop stuff. It's when I'm you're really doing pop stuff. Like yeah. so, you're not doing traditional music. You're doing like yeah, you're actually, lo- like lovely yeah. scream, screaming long lines on the pipes, and you're doubling up the electric guitar or the keyboard. Yeah. That stuff is great because it's like you're you're just doing something completely different on the instrument. It's like being able to allow to do what you wouldn't dare do in your normal working <laughs> life. <laughs> it's like this. Uh, yeah, it's po- sort of going way beyond what what you what would work maybe even in your your normal setting yeah. and in, in that setting think, it does work so yeah i think i like doing the two extremes like i love when i'm playing yeah. trad music or acoustic stuff it's just to really do that you know i don't feel yeah. the need to do um over the top arrangements and make make things too complicated but then at the yeah. same time doing pop things or or, or orchestral or or whatever the, the yeah. other stuff uh, i love just taking that to yeah <laughs> extremes you know yeah, it's fun. I, you, I mean, I'm very grateful for the fact that you got me involved at times with the the Angelo project as well. And there was one um, where I filled in on the fiddle, and it was f- filming for one of his songs. And the 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 director said, "Can you stand up on that tower over there, and 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 we'll pan, <laughs> pan over to you?" And Angelo said to me, "Oh, he's asking you to do the things you you always said you wouldn't do." And, it, and I said, "No, <laughs> this is what I've always wanted to do. <laughs> always, you've always wanted to do." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Oh, so, yeah, so that, that's been yeah. great. That, it's great to have those chances, I think. And um, and and I, I really admire the fact that you you just go for these things and uh, and em- embrace them. Yeah. Oh, I've got absolutely no problems doing that. I think as long yeah. as there's there's real music being produced by people who actually really care about it, and there's a really high level of musicianship, and everyone's having a good time doing it, I don't really mind what I'm doing. I'll always need to do a lot of traditional music. That is what I am. Without that, I wouldn't exist really musically. So uh, I always go back to that. Well, all the best of luck with all the upcoming tours and the release of the album. Um, And uh, I hope it all really goes well for you. And thanks very much for sharing your thoughts and your music with us. Thanks for having me, Andrew. And we'll see you again. Cheers. Cheers.